Hello and welcome. This is the Chapter 12 video lecture on critical thinking and clinical decision making. Uh, quite an important topic because paramedics have to be able to uh, identify problems, set patient care priorities, develop care plans, execute those plans. Um, just think about, you know, how as a paramedic you have to respond to a call with very limited amount of information, uh, figure out what's going on with that patient, develop your treatment strategy, be pretty good, uh, and, and, and execute that uh, treatment strategy appropriately, utilizing appropriate drug math, appropriate uh, medication administration, appropriate EKG interpretation, all of these things uh, that you have to develop throughout your career, throughout your education, and then execute uh, in a pretty high, highly uh, stressful situation, oftentimes. Uh, cookbook medicine. Uh, you do not want to be a cookbook medic. Cookbook medics are like your old protocol drone. They blindly follow steps without fitting them into, you know, the specific circumstances involved. It's a, not an effective way to practice paramedicine. Many patients present atypically. The pre-hospital environment is dynamic. Uh, you know, remember, patients' bodies don't necessarily read the textbook, so they might not present with the classic findings. That classic pre presentation uh, isn't, isn't so... Uh, classic oftentimes the scene may be unstable emergency settings may be chaotic and unsafe and you have to be able to utilize critical thinking in those situations paramedics are expected to provide quality patient care and that does require you to think outside the box not you know fall into that tunnel vision that can often happen again uh, i use the scenario of like the horse with blinders on that can only see in front of them you know the racing horses because they don't want them to be distracted by the other horses on the track same idea, you know, a paramedic can, can often put blinders on and tunnel in on the wrong thing because you have this cognitive bias uh, acting against you, making you, you know, go down the wrong path. You have to remain open, utilizing critical thinking and figuring out what's going on with these different types of calls. You got to be able to communicate and obtain information from many types of patients. Just think about the different age groups, educational backgrounds, abilities to communicate. Some patients have consumed drugs or alcohol, there's language barriers, hearing impairments. All of these things can make it very hard to obtain information and you have to utilize your critical thinking skills to be able to gather that information. Then you have to figure out what's good information, what's bad information, what's valid, what's not valid from the scene, from the patient, from the bystanders. Uh, synthesize that information all at the same time uh, in a highly stressful environment, uh, oftentimes, you know, so it is a, it is a pretty, uh, crazy skill to develop, you know, it's, 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 and, and you're constantly developing it because you're, this information that, that you're using is developed over time through running calls. As you run more calls, you have this knowledge base that you draw upon on the ne next call and, oh, I've seen something like this before and, You'll, you'll be one step ahead or you've never seen anything like this before and you have to draw upon this information from a partner, from a firefighter who has seen something like this before. You know, or maybe it's completely unique. Here's an example that your textbook gives. A 64-year-old male reporting chest pains. History includes diabetes type 1. Uh, he's, since he was a kid, he's a long-time smoker. So some things are going through my head already. The guy's got chest pain and he's got type 1 diabetes for a long time. When you have type 1 diabetes for a long period of time, you develop neuropathy and you don't feel pain to the same extent as your average person. So the fact that this person is complaining of chest pain could be pretty significant. Uh, also, type 1 diabetics, they have uh, vascular diseases. They don't have good circulation. Uh, we, we know that, right? So that's, those are your comorbidities. A comorbidity is when the patient has two or more chronic diseases or conditions. Comorbidities like diabetes are directly related to circulatory complications. So keep that in mind. Uh, diabetics often develop, you know, vascular disease. We know that because they get uh, so distal infections because of the inability to fight off, you know, simple infections because of poor uh, circulation to their periphery. The patient's other com comorbidity is COPD, which is a disease of poor gas exchange that frequently results in hypoxia and hypercarbia. Also not good. You must consider the patient's comorbidities while you assess his new symptom, the onset of chest pain. So synthesis in this case, I have a patient with diseases of both circulation and gas exchange. There is a possibility that the patient, uh, or I'm sorry, that the part of the patient's heart is dying because blood vessels are unable to deliver oxygenated blood. All right, so you're synthesizing all that information together. Comorbidities are something you always consider. 
always consider when you're, when you're treating a patient. So identify the chief complaint, establish a working diagnosis, treatment plans guided by patient care protocols, standing orders, uh, protocols or standing orders define the essential clinical standard of care, right? That's your, especially your local standard of care and your local scope of practice. So you need critical thinking skills for all of this. Identifying the chief complaint, you know, that's kind of basic, but establishing a working diagnosis is super advanced. You have to be able to utilize all the information you're going to gain throughout paramedic school, throughout your career, um, e you know, even supplemental classes, uh, information that you get at, at the littlest things. You know, when you t drop a patient off at the hospital and you pay attention to the type of diagnostics they perform or what happened with that patient, you're gathering that information throughout your career in order to make good clinical judgment and decisions. Protocols and standing orders specify performance parameters when medical control should be contacted. It's very true, right? So you can go to a certain extent with just treating the patient without calling anybody, but sometimes there's cases where you want to get on the horn, call the receiving facility, and, and get some uh, additional orders. Protocols promote both a standard approach and standard of quality care as defined by regional, state, or, or national standards. So the way it works is the national scope of practice lets you know kind of what all paramedics in, in the nation can do. The, you know, and then the state will narrow that and they'll say, well, we will identify these things that you're, you're allowed to perform. And the state of Florida is pretty good because the state of Florida really gives almost all the control to the local medical directors. And then so when you get to local protocols, local protocols are, are standing orders that are approved by the local medical director. And that's kind of where your scope of practice ends up, practicing under that local protocol. Uh, they provide parameters for medical control, so they do not order treatment with medications beyond your level of training or what is usually carried out on your unit. We know that. Um, so some things, like you want to keep it as a guideline because there could be uh, things that the protocol or patient care algorithms don't, don't address, like a vague patient complaint that does not fit into the neat clinical description, right? Uh, or somebody that has multiple disease etiologies. Patients with atypical presentations will require multiple treatment modalities, so keep that in mind. Using judgment and independent decision making. Uh, you must immediately recognize and treat life threats. That is huge as a paramedic. You know, you gotta, you, you can have a very stable patient that becomes unstable right in front of you and it takes, you know, the snap of a finger to get there. And as a paramedic, you gotta be ready for that um, and ready to act on it. And that is one of the most difficult skills to learn uh, and to develop. And it really is kind of the, the separation of, of whether you're going to be able to perform for a long duration throughout your career uh, with critical patients. Because they can crash on you and you have to be ready uh, to perform and, and act on that. Uh, thinking and working under pressure. Uh, to avert disaster, you must have knowledge, excellent clinical skills. It makes sense, right? That's why we hone these skills. Um, the, the final cornerstone of your paramedic practice is the ability to think and work under pressure. You ring, let's give an example. You ring a doorbell of the address to, to which you have been dis dispatched and a hysterical mother opens that door. She hands you a cyanotic, apneic, 14-month-old who has been submerged in a bathtub. All right, so you have a baby handed to you that basically drowned and they're cyanotic. Uh, only a combination of, of knowledge coupled with excellent clinical skills will allow you to avert a patient care disaster. Um, so that statement is, it, it's kind of strong. You, you're picturing this child that's blue, that was drowned, you know, has drowned in the bathtub being handed to you. And now you have to utilize excellent clinical skills and superb knowledge to be able to manage that patient. It's probably the most difficult scenario a paramedic can be presented with. Um, and it's just one patient, right? You know, I'm not even talking about a big MCI or something, some big, huge disaster. It, uh, just a, a, a very sick child that needs your help and they need it now. Um, so there's uh, the range of patient conditions. You must be able to determine if the patient is sick or not sick. We've talked about that before. And then you want to quantify how sick are they, okay? Uh, for patients who are sick, you must be able to quantify how sick they are. Uh, this allows you 
to make the best choices as to the care you must provide on the scene or in the ambulance while you're en route to the hospital. This process becomes more complicated when you have multiple sick or injured patients. Clear thinking in an emergency starts with the triage process, a process of sorting your patients into four categories based on the severity of their injuries. Okay, patients in critical condition get red tags, uh, patients in unstable condition, yellow tags, mortality wounded, uh, black tags, green tags for the walking wounded. We, we know about this, right? Start triage. Life threats include major multi-system trauma, devastating uh, single system trauma, end-stage disease presentations, acute presentations of chronic conditions. Okay, critical thinking at its finest. Got to triage patients. And that's why we do so many things with, very, with deliberate training, with mannequins, uh, repetition over and over and over again. Because we're trying to get it to where it's almost brainless, right? So if that patient, let's go back a few slides, that you know child that's handed to you that's blue that was submerged in a bathtub, when that happens, it's it's very difficult to separate emotion and skill and, and the job and everything. But hopefully, you've practiced enough times, you know exactly what to do. You, you put that patient down, you start your chest compressions, you, you know, we get that supplemental oxygen and, and ventilations ready and going and full on CPR and we get to the you know, ambulance, we get the patient on the monitor, we, you know, we revive them, we provide our resuscitative efforts uh, expertly and post-resuscitative eff uh, efforts expertly and get them to the hospital. That's hopefully what happens, right? All those things fall into place because we've practiced deliberately several times and we make it almost a, a mindless uh, skill in a sense that you're not thinking about it, you're just getting it done. Mindless doesn't mean stupid. Mindless means you don't have to think about it to get it done, at least in, in the context that I'm trying to use it. So thinking and working under pressure, unstable conditions include serious multisystem trauma, acute presentations of first-line medical events, uh, multiple disease etiologies, non-life-threatening injuries include simple abrasions, partial thickness, burns. We know this. Okay, so uh, you've got to separate unstable conditions from stable, non-life-threatening conditions. Uh, again, that's a critical thinking skill that you develop over time. You will be, get to the point where you walk in the room, you see somebody tripoding or using accessory muscles, and it stands out more to you. Or skin color, you know, that gray ashen color of, oh, that's somebody that's pretty dang sick. I better get to treating them pretty fast. That You have to develop that over time. It doesn't necessarily come right away. Yeah, I could teach you about rails, audible rails, from when, before you walk into a room or the use of accessory muscles and why that's important to be able to recognize and, and different positions, head bobbing and all of that. But until you see it in the clinical uh, setting uh, and that really sinks in with you that, oh, that patient's sick, um, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna be that quick, like snap of the fingers, you're, now you're making clin good clinical decisions because you've identified that the patient's sick. It's not gonna come to you that easy. At least for most people, it doesn't come, come to them that easy. You develop that skill over time of being able from across the room to look at a patient and say, they're sick, right? If you're using a lot of muscles to breathe, if you're working to breathe, that's not normal. So that's what we always say, uh, labored breathing. They're working to breathe, labored, um, or, um, you know, just their positioning. You know, if you see somebody in the tripod position, they're trying to hold their chest up off their diaphragm, you know, that's another ominous sign. Like that person is in severe respiratory distress, maybe even close to respiratory failure, and you got to get to treating them. All right, so moving on, concept formation, first stage of the critical thinking process, gather information from your uh, senses and diagnostic tools, begins as the paramedic arrives on the scene. You're going to start forming concepts as you arrive on the scene. Uh, the process continues with the performance of the primary survey to identify and correct any immediate threats to your patient's life relative to your ABCs, right? Uh, you continue on as you perform the secondary assessment and your physical exam and identify the patient's chief complaint, of course. A uh, sample, uh, signs, symptoms, allergies, medications, past pertinent medical history, last oral intake, and all the events leading up to this illness or injury. Uh, follows that and you determine a pertinent medical history, any medications that they're taking, which that's kind of like the same as the comorbidities thing. Because as you find out what medications they're taking, you find out what some of their comorbidities are and it helps you with your differential diagnosis. Second stage of critical thinking process is data interpretation. 
And you want to evaluate all the data you've gathered, or data, depending on how you say it, uh, you've gathered and form a conclusion. This is kind of where you start getting into your differential. The paramedics should understand how the body works and how it responds when complications arise and should also have a solid background in A&P and patho. Uh, another key element in your level of education and experience before coming to the, uh, into the paramedic program, um, emergency medical technicians have an excellent platform to build on. Applying yourself in your studies will also help you meet the challenges. Uh, so being a good EMT before being uh, a paramedic is, is another uh, great way to, to be prepared uh, out there to be a paramedic. A good attitude is paramount in, in good healthcare and includes showing compassion and interest for each patient, providing the best care for each patient. Uh, the third stage of the critical thinking process is the application of principle. Uh, field depression becomes a working diagnosis. Working diagnosis is what you tentatively believe to be the problem and focus of your treatment. A working diagnosis is what you tentatively believe to be the problem and the focus of your treatment. The treatment plan is determined by the patient care protocols and standing orders, and it's going to go based on whatever your working diagnosis is. And then we have the fourth stage of the critical thinking process, which is reflection and action, uh, is actively treating the patients while monitoring the intervention effects. So you're treating and monitoring, treating and monitoring, avoid tunnel vision. You want to make sure you keep an open mind and you don't necessarily focus in on only one thing. Just because you start down a certain treatment path doesn't mean there couldn't be another a condition going on, a comorbidity, if you will, or uh, you could have just been wrong you know, with what you thought was wrong with the patient and, and it's something else and you have to keep that open mind and be willing to uh, allow yourself to be wrong, you know, like be willing to say, I was wrong, now redirect and treat the patient appropriately. That's super important. And then reflection on, on the action uh, is the last stage in the critical thinking process and occurs after the call is over. You, you always want to review these calls, especially the, the higher acuity calls, you know, while you're in paramedic school, review every call that you run. But, you know, following that, when you become a paramedic and you run, you run more and more calls as a paramedic, you're definitely going to want to review the, the critical patients or the patients where there was a lot of, you know, thinking that went on while you were on the call. And that's going to make you get better and better and better. And don't assume you were right. If you don't find out what was going on with the patient at the hospital, don't assume you were right. Take in all the information you can. You know, research it. Try to figure out what the diagnosis was at the hospital. But if you can't, at least, you know, research those signs and symptoms and how the patient presented. Fundamental elements that contribute to critical thinking and clinical decision-making process include the following. Adequate knowledge of A&P and pathophysiology, as we said before. The ability to gather and organize data or data and form concepts. The ability to focus on specific and multiple elements of data. Uh, ability to identify and deal with medical ambiguity. Medical ambiguity is like you have somebody, let's say a shortness of breath patient that has wheezing. Well, that wheezing could be what we call cardiac asthma, which is a sign of CHF. They really have fluids in their lungs, but it's presenting as wheezing. It's kind of weird how that can happen. Or they could have asthma or COPD, bron you know, bronchial constriction causing the wheezing. So that's medical ambiguity. Uh, they could have rails or what sounds like rails from pneumonia or from CHF. And you, you have to kind of identify that. So uh, there's a lot of different things that are a bit ambiguous when it comes to the clinical presentations. And you have to use critical thinking to kind of decipher what's going on with the patient. Uh, also, skill in differentiating between relevant and irrelevant data. We, you talked about that, kind of ciphering out what's valid, what's not valid, what matters, what doesn't matter, so on and so forth. And the capability to analyze and compare similar situations. Remember, you're building that knowledge base as you go throughout your career from different calls. So everybody, every paramedic is different and, and actually it's going to be more useful in different situations because they've had similar situations than that in the past. Um, you know, no one paramedic is the best paramedic for every call, but different paramedics could be the best paramedic for, you know, every call. Meaning, every paramedic out there has probably run 
a call similar to the next. You know, there's there's at least one paramedic out there in the world that's run a call similar to the next call, and they would be the best one suited to manage that call. Now, obviously, that you know doesn't necessarily happen like that, and you have to build your own knowledge base, but also use the knowledge base of your crew, meaning your partners, the firefighters on scene, maybe nurses on scene if, if you're in a nursing home or cl other clinicians, so on and so forth, and constantly build uh, that that network of a knowledge base so you can manage these calls. And that's why we, we do so much deliberate practice because that also adds again to that knowledge base um, and, and makes these things go by a little smoothly, more smoothly. Elements that contribute to critical thinking the capability to analyze and compare contrary situations and the ability to articulate your reasoning and construct arguments. Um, moving on, each call has unique circumstances, checklists to facilitate thinking under pressure. Uh, you've heard of job aids before, um, the very, very good way of helping with critical thinking process. The drug math thing has been a, a, a big one. There's been a lot of medication errors and dosing errors throughout the years in the field of paramedicine. So coming up with different tools, not necessarily to say paramedics are too dumb to do math, but to say, okay, we realize this is a highly stressful situation and some of the, the most stressful situations are the ones where we have to complete this very difficult, you know, difficult math, depending on, you know, the situation. The most difficult math that a paramedic does is for pediatric patients, okay, right? They're, all the doses are weight-based, there's several different drugs, and they're not the, the normal amount of volume that we, we administer to an adult patient. So, and those patients are typically when we have the most stress. We have the families, we have other care providers that are under a lot of stress, we have sick kids, and now we have to perform this math. So coming up with different tools like the hand heavy system, which we'll review in class, is a really good idea to improve this, the overall safety of the patients. And, and it really gives you the confidence as a paramedic uh, knowing that you have a tool like that to help you if you were to need it. So here are the six R's of clinical de decision making. And you'll notice when you, as a paramedic, anywhere in the clinical field that they can come up with six R's or the six rights or uh, AFPU, you know, DCAP BTLS, a mnemonic, all of these things, they're just to help you remember things. Um, to me, it's not super important that you memorize these six R's. I'd rather you remember the six rights, um, but we'll, we'll at least uh, talk about them really briefly right now. Uh, read the scene, read the patient, react, reevaluate, revise the treatment plan, review performance. So this is kind of what I just went over when it, in the steps for critical thinking, clinical decision making. Um, this, it's all going to be the same idea. It's, it's about being able to respond to these situations, figure out what's going on, come up with a good plan, executing that plan, reviewing that plan, and then after it's all over, reviewing it again. And, and, and then you're building your knowledge base. So that's what it, critical thinking is, is all about. It's really about making good decisions, good judgments in high stress situations. That's what critical thinking is. When you uh, go back to the module, you're going to see there's a lot of videos on critical thinking. Please take the time to watch them. Um, if some of them are a little bit longer and you know you don't want to watch the whole thing, I think this one on cognitive blind spots is a little bit longer, and then this other one on uh, enhancing cognition, critical thinking, clinical decision making, and acute care. Which it's a really good video. These are really good. Um, the TED talks are a little bit easier to watch. And this guy's awesome. Uh, advice for a young resuscitationist. Uh, he's really good. So watch the videos. Try to think about why I put them in the critical uh, thinking module. Uh, because, I mean, some of them are, are obvious. Five tips to improve your critical thinking. That's kind of an obvious one. Uh, but think about why I put those videos there. And if you're, if you're gaining something from them, watch the whole thing. Some of them are pretty specific and, and, and kind of really about the medicine, the crashing patient. This is a great video for you to watch at any point in your career, you know, in paramedic school, in P1, P2, or P3. And then as a paramedic, these crashing patient videos are really good because it, it's an emergency physician going over difficult case from the ER, but you can gain so much information uh, just by watching those videos and, and help with your critical thinking. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, quick lecture on critical thinking. It's not it's not a topic that's kind of 
super objective and easy to teach, like, you know, things that are really clear cut, like patient assessment or uh, cardiology for me. Um, but it is a super important topic, so I figured I'd give you a good introductory video here. All right, until next time.